you're all just joining us this afternoon in Toronto and in Texas or this evening in Israel. We have a good show lined up for tonight and everybody who's new with us. This is a weekly podcast, often on Wednesdays, sometimes on Sundays. We have some guests with us today and it should be a fun show. So everybody to kind of tune in, stay tight and uh, we'll get started momentarily. It is a Never Given Live show with uh, Mayor Weinstein out of Toronto, who's our host. We have some opportunities to call in later and voice your opinions and participate, join us, like us, share us. The darkness of the world cannot swallow the glow of a single candle as we bring to right now this uh, holiday or Hanukkah edition of our show. Or as Rabbi Schneerson said, remember that in a hall of perfect darkness, totally dark, if you light one small candle, its light will be seen from afar. Its precious light will be seen by everyone. And this certainly is particularly pertinent the spirit and the survival of us and our people and of Israel. So tonight's special edition, again, we'll we'll have a simulcast in Israel. We know that even during the the darkest of times, we managed to show the glow of Judaism. There's a first annual, hopefully of many more, Hanukkah edition. Please do help support Israel Now at israelnow.ca. So once again, we'll be joining you tonight from Toronto, where we have Mayor Weinstein. We'll have me down here in South Texas running the studio. And we'll link it together with Burch Ben Yosef in Israel. And we'll talk a little bit about him this evening before we introduce him shortly. So right out of completing high school in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, correction, he made Aliyah to Israel. He enlisted in Israel Defense Forces Commando Unit, and he continued to serve until well into his 30s. He's been involved in law as both as a client, as a lawyer, as a plaintiff, as a defendant, taking all aspects of Israeli law and Zionism. And he's the chairman of the movement to restore the temple. And he's a founding member of Israel's temple movement. And it's an honor always to have him with us. And of course, in memory and always keeping in mind, Rabbi Kahani, it is not decency or goodness or gentleness that impresses the Middle East, but strength. We have to remember this, because Hanukkah is a prime example how it's strength that works, not kumbaya and tikkun olam, but strength. And that's what we need to show as Jews. I prefer a powerful and proud Jewish state that is hated by the entire world than an Auschwitz that is loved by one and all. So please join us in the fight against anti-Semitism at israelnow.ca. Mayor, talk a little bit about Hanukkah. Be with us momentarily. And here's Mayor. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Thank you for joining us. I'm going to ask everyone if you could please share this on the various uh, pages, uh, platforms that you have on social media. We'll reach a lot more people, whether you you have various groups and pages on Facebook or on uh, Instagram, Twitter. uh, Please share this. Uh, We'll reach a lot more people. Also, uh, rather than a call-in for today, uh, there's messages it's an active message board 
you could send messages, comments, uh, questions. We'll do our best to address uh, your concerns this afternoon. We're going to be dealing with uh, uh, the show is split into two. The first segment of the show, <clears throat> we're going to have Borah Ben Yosef uh, joining us, who's going to be uh, bringing us up to date with uh, uh, issues of concern and also uh, Hanukkah, according to Rabbi Meir Kahana. So you could hear the emet, the truth, what we should be doing and what the vision should be. Uh, and we'll be discussing the uh, Harbite Temple Mount as well. It's incredible progress uh, being made and Baruch has been uh, right from the start, uh, like 30 years ago, working on this important issue for the Jewish people. Seems to be uh, uh, going in, in a great direction right now and he'll fill us in on all that. Also, uh, in the second part of the show, We'll be dealing with uh, the fight against anti-Semitism, BDS anti-Semitism. Uh, in fact, today, uh, BDS groups that support Hamas and Hamas, uh, the terrorist organization that represents a lot of Arabs in uh, Judea and Samaria and uh, throughout Israel, um, made a threat that if uh, the president of Israel goes to Hebron, uh, to the cave of the patriots to light the menorah the first candle uh and that's right now you know in toronto eastern standard time it's like 1 30 or it's just before two o'clock right now but there's a seven hour difference so it already happened in israel they were warning the president of israel not to go to hebron to light the candle that they're threatening with violence and they again they deny the right of the jewish people to anything in the land of israel including hebron and it's uh, preposterous. That's where it started. Avraham purchased, made the purchase in Hebron, and we're there. So uh, we'll be discussing that as well, and these BDS, various BDS campaigns that are filled with hate and nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Jew hatred. But also uh, in Canada, uh, there's uh, the largest uh, union, CUPE. Canadian Union of Public Employees that uh, this past week, they had a national convention and they were voting on whether or not to adopt the BDS, the Hamas platform. And in large part due to our efforts uh, of lobbying and speaking and speaking out, uh, we were able to convince enough people to vote against it and the motion did not pass. Uh, so that was uh, a success we had. We're also going to be talking about uh, the University of Toronto that um, the student union at the Scarborough campus just passed a, uh, a motion. They want to put it into law. Can you believe this? I want to put it into law that on the one hand uh, to deny Jewish groups on campus access to any of the university funding that goes to any groups on campus by law, uh, but they went further. And they said that they are going to penalize, they're going to make it uh, a crime on campus for Jewish students to bring kosher food on campus uh, unless they could prove that who they receive the kosher food from does not support Israel in any way at all. So uh, we'll be discussing that as well. And Ron East will be joining us uh, in the second half of the program. We'll be discussing that a lot of it. There's a lot going on, so let's bring on Borach right now and let's talk about uh, what's going on uh, in Israel. Borach, how are you doing? Hey, great. How are you doing, Mayor? Perfect. Doing Happy well. Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Hug Sameach. Uh, it must Hug be incredible. Sameach. You're in Kiryat Arba, right next to uh, Hebron, and bring us up oh, yeah, to date. I was, yeah, I was. Uh, I got caught in the uh, the the. Um, the traffic jams because the the when the president came obviously the police were out there blocking traffic right. he flew in in his helicopter uh, an army helicopter brought him in and it's really uh, unbelievable to think that uh you know president who was uh, basically always the, who was the head of the labor party right. and um when he became president he actually uh, you know is is doing his job in the essence of uh that he's trying to represent all of Am Yisrael, and he picks Hebron as a place to come and start the holiday. It's really a really special event. 
What are you hearing so, from your friends who live there? I mean, they're my friends too, but you have more friends there uh, who live right in Hebron and in Kiryat Arba. Well, I have a, you're able to make it there. What are you hearing from them? Well, I mean, obviously I have family here. I mean, I live in Kiryat Arba. My, my daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren live in Hebron. I was there on Shabbat in Hebron. Obviously, a lot, a lot of us walk down um, on Shabbat to Hebron to go to the uh, cave of the Machpelah for the prayers. Uh, every actually every um, every fourth week, the uh, army opens up the back gate to the old road, which used to go down. Now it's off limits to us, but they open it up to us, and uh, the army escorts us down there through the old road, blocks the traffic, uh, so the the Arabs have to stop driving, and we. We walked down to the cave of the Machpelah, which we did this past Shabbat. And um, look, uh, one of the main things here is to show Jewish sovereignty, mm -hmm. which obviously over the years has has we've been losing it uh, slowly but surely uh, because of the uh, the uh, the failures of the governments or the or the, tre the treasonous acts of the governments that have have been um, have we've had over the years and. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a constant effort to try to continue to show our sovereignty, whether it's it's uh, riding, driving the roads, or walking the, the 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 paths, or whatever it is, building building houses uh, across the board. It's always a fight. It's always a struggle. It's not easy because um, the government uh, the government uh, backs down. It's it's fearful. It, it, it fears the 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 enemies, uh, like you mentioned, BDS and all the all the enemies out there. And I think that's uh, really when I look at Rabbi Kahana's message for for Hanukkah, I think that that's his um, you know one one of his main messages. I was looking at uh, is is the, the the how the one of the reasons why back then in the days of the of the Maccabees in the days of Hanukkah. Was that the um, the uh, Hellenists, the Jews that basically sided with the Greeks instead of with their own people? Uh, a lot of it was out of fear, not out of not out of um, really, you know, believing in the in the Hellenist uh, beliefs, right. but out of fear or out of you know wanting to not, not wanting to have to stand up to them. Obviously, you're dealing with Greece was was a major superpower of the day. And you had to stand up to them, and they were afraid. So it was easier just to, instead of, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, as they say. And that's, he says, that's the story of Hanukkah, is that those Jews that didn't didn't uh, back down and didn't give in and didn't give up, didn't join the enemy because they said, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. In fact, if I was looking here at the uh, at Rabbi Kahana's book, the, uh, Jewish, the, the Jewish Idea, he writes... That the the one of the main problem, one of the main um, curses on the Jewish people, is the exile. Obviously, remember Hanukkah takes place after the 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 second exile to to Babylon. First exile was to Egypt, where we almost got lost as a nation until you know uh, Hashem redeemed us through through Moshe and Aaron. And the second at the second exile to Babylon, after the first temple was destroyed. So again, there's this exile that we went into, it, it almost decimated the Jewish people. If we know the fa the facts are amazing. Yep. Ezra and Nehemia, when they saw when they came back to the land of Israel, there's only forty two thousand people that came with them. The most of the people, the rank and file of Jewish people, the leaders, the rabbis, they all stayed in Babylon. You know, in fact, this past Shabbat, the uh, rabbi I learned with every Shabbat here in Kiryat Arba. He said, the amazing thing is, is that Ezra and Nehemia came back with the riffraff, and they, this riffraff that came back with him, they became the great sages of the Talmud, the Tanaim and the Amoraim. Wow. He said, those wise men of Babylon who stayed there, all of their descendants, they all, uh, you know, they all uh, uh, became, uh, became Goyim. They all uh, uh, assimilated. And it's, a, it's just amazing. They said so. Rabbi Kahana starts off by saying how how the, the, the exile is a curse to us, and um, 
especially this as last exile. I mean, here we, I don't talk about the second exile, but the third exile of two thousand years is be far worse, far worse than the the exile of Babylon. And he says the the problem is, is the Jews have, be, have fallen under the the uh, the culture, the foreign culture of the Goyim, and the 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 Hellenism of today is far worse than the Hellenism that existed in the time of the of the Maccabees of Hanukkah. Um, he says it's destroyed the Jews. It's destroyed the, so many Jews um, that it's it's basically conquered the, the the minds and spirit of the Jewish people, and they don't understand. Uh, like Rabbi Khan used to say, the, the 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 rabbis wouldn't understand the Jewish concept if they if they tripped over one. It, it's it's just it just conquered. Jewish mind across the board, Jews that are Hellenists or Jews that are are assimilated, or even if it's Orthodox and, and, and Jews and rabbis, this 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 exile has just conquered the Jewish people, their minds, their souls, their spirits, and that's what we're fighting here. We're fighting this this exile uh, mentality that even exists here in Israel, uh, unfortunately. You would think that after we came back and, def and and won the wars and and built this this strong army, that um, you know, and 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 a, and a state that does has so many successes in all in all in all realms, you would think that okay, the exile mentality wouldn't exist here, but it does, and that's why there's so many bad decisions are made based on this fear that 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 comes from the exile mentality. So, you know, uh, Laura, let me just uh, <clears throat> just cut in for a second. So, uh, today in Hebron, the peace now, together with other extreme left wing groups, they join the Hamas supporters in Hebron to try to prevent the menorah lighting by the president of Israel. That's well, I, I can't prevent it. Uh, it well, yeah, I mean, they, they can't prevent it, but but they but they're look, they they have joined forces with the enemy. The question is why? Why would Jews join forces with the enemy with pe with with people that um, have engraved on their flag the destruction of the Jewish people of the of the state of Israel and the Jewish people? Why why would that be? And again, we know we could sit here and have we could talk for hours. About the Jewish psyche and 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 really try to try to understand it, but I think it's I think it's what happened here. <laughs> of the exile mentality of fear, fear of the nations. You know, Rabbi God used to say, having faith and and trust in Hashem and God is not an easy thing. When you have to stand up against the entire world and 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 say you know you're on one side and we're on the other and we we don't care how many of the of there are there are of you we don't care it doesn't matter if it's if abraham goes to fight the four kings with some say just with eliezer his, his servant some say with 318 of his students whatever it was it doesn't matter he was outnumbered i don't know by how many thousands to one <laughs> against the, the the superpowers of that generation and he went and fought and won and that's the that's real that's that's true jewish history that's true uh um that's that's the understanding of what we are the maccabees were a handful of people it was a family of, of a father and five sons the koanim the priests who had enough of what was going on and they started a guerrilla war which ended up Gaining, uh, gaining uh, 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 strength, so they were able to stand up to the to the superpower of the day of the Greeks, mm -hmm. the 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 you know later in the time of the Romans, the Bar Kokhba re revolution. I mean, this is this is you know Jewish history. This is what we're about. And then it took two thousand years till Joseph Trumpeldor, Joseph Jabotinsky, together with David Ben Gurion, created the uh, uh, the first Jewish army in two thousand years. To fight, to to, to first to throw the the Turks out of Eretz Israel, 
and then ultimately throw the British out of Eretz Israel. <clears throat> this is this is who we are, and that's what this the the Israeli Defense Forces was. Um, you know this 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 ragtag army that could stand up to 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 uh, no matter how many armies came to fight us, we were able to stand up against them. And really, that's that's the the understanding that we could stand up to anybody, no matter how many armies there are, no matter how many soldiers there are, no matter what weaponry they have, we could stand up to them because Hashem is on our side, and we have that we have that secret weapon that they don't have, and unfortunately, we don't understand that the lack of tr trust and faith in Hashem right. is the core of the problem, mm -hmm. and that's also the solution is. The, tr the, tr the, the trust and faith that Rabbi Kahana had that. He had that. That's what he taught us. And unfortunately, the, the fearful joined forces with the enemy. And, and um, because of that, he was killed. He was murdered. Only because he was denied the, he was denied the, the, the ability to run, to run for the Knesset. He would have gotten who knows how many, how many seats in the Knesset. He, he, he ended up. We would have ended up uh, taking over the government, but right. Fearful Jews are are the problem, and that's what Hellenism is. Hellenism. Right. These these peace now traitors join forces with the enemy because they think that that that's they'll be saved that way. The the the, the Hamas will remember that peace now backed us up. When the president of Israel came to Hebron, they think that they're going to be saved by that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Right, it's really ridiculous. No, oh, absolutely. Listen, we have a short clip of uh, the menorah lighting in Hebron. I think it's important to show our viewers that clip for a moment. Then you could continue on, Bora. Oh. Well, 
it's incredible, Bork, that, uh, you know, when you reflect, reflect back to before there was a state of Israel, uh, you know, we lost 6 million Jews during the Holocaust and uh, everyone was degrade, degraded. And yet, you know, we see, we see miracles going on. There's, there's like 7 million Jews living in Israel now. And it's on the way up. The birth rate is strong for Jews. Yes. I wanted to point out that's kind of funny. I was thinking while, while the president is standing there in front of the, the ark, in that ark behind him is the Sefer Torah in memory of Rabbi Kahana dedicated by Baruch Goldstein. <laughs> and and the and the uh, the gab the the gabbai's in 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 the in the cave of the Machpelah told me that that's the most popular sefer Torah. It's the it's the best written wow. and most popular one used there. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure the president you know doesn't know that. You know the president is on record today saying, apparently. Uh, I believe he said his grandmother uh, survived the massacre in 1929 in Hebron by the Arabs who slaughtered Jews there in 1929. So he really he talked about I, that. I didn't know that. That's what he said. And I saw it, in fact, on a tweet from him earlier today. In fact, oh, there's a, a meme about the connection with... Uh, uh, the Mufti and the Nazis, and it's, I mean, it just goes way back. It's uh, unbridled hatred of the Jews. Things never changed in Jerusalem a week ago. Yeah. I mean, my, when my, my uh, like I said, my daughter and son-in-law and, and grandchildren live in Hebron uh, a few years ago because their family became so big, they had to move. They would have been living for years inside a caravan. So they had to move to a bigger, they got the opportunity to move to a bigger uh, house. They moved into a house which is called Beit Castell, the house of Rabbi Castell. Rabbi Castell, his house was next to what's called the uh, Beit Hadassah building, which is owned by the Hadassah organization. It was the infirmary that there was, you know, uh, it was like a clinic, a medical clinic used both by the Jews and Arabs. And um, in 1929, the Arabs massacred you know, the, the, the people inside Beit, the Beit Adassa building, uh, despite the fact that, of course, it was, a, it was, a, it was like a, an infirmary or a, or a clinic. And uh, next door, they murdered Rabbi Castell and his family. And so my, that's where my, um, my daughter and son-in-law, my, my grandchildren live there today. In that house that um, that Rabbi Castell and his family lived in. Wow! So you, whenever I visit there, you can feel the 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 the, the history inside the building, the, the the presence of these great Jews that lived in Hebron back then and were massacred by the Arabs, but we came back never to leave again. That's what we're doing here. Right. Like I said, we're showing Jewish presence, Jewish sovereignty. Absolutely. You know, on the uh, last time you were on, you spoke about um, that you've been working with people for the past 30 years or so on the issue of uh, the Temple Mount, uh, getting more Jews to visit the Temple Mount. Uh, and <clears throat> I just read an announcement this week that uh, um the government approved that uh, uh, it's going to be part of the curriculum in the school system in Israel now to teach about the Temple Mount and to have regular trips of classes uh, from these schools to visit the uh, Temple Mount. Apparently, uh, you know, Hamas and the BDS are going completely mental about this, but you know, it seems to be a positive trajectory that's going on right now. What do you have to say about that? Well, let's see, see it's very interesting. Uh, as much as we despise this government that was created um, through the act of uh, basically the right-wing parties 
uh, Yamina and the uh, Tikva Hadasha right. and uh, and uh, Habayit Yehudi, these three right wing parties uh, joining forces with the left wing parties, Meretz and uh, and the Labor, as well as uh, Lapid's uh, 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 party and and all these leftist parties together with the right wing parties created a government backed by the Arabs, by the Arab parties, the 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 representatives of the Hamas are in the government. I mean, it's the most ridiculous government, most outrageous government that's ever existed here in Israel. Yet, at the same time, we see here that the, the what you're referring to was a meeting with the heads of the uh, Temple Mount movement, together with the Minister of uh, Religious Affairs, Matan Kahana. Right. And he, uh, no relation to Rabbi Kahana. Right. And he... Um, uh, came out openly, supported the uh, the uh, the Aliyah of Jews to the Temple Mount, uh, and for the the prayer of Jews on the Temple Mount. And as you said, he told, spoke about the importance of educating the uh, the youth about the uh, the importance of the Temple Mount. So, despite the fact that we have this this um, very strange government. We we find here a, a, a much uh, a, at least in that in that aspect, in fact, maybe the only aspect that I could see that this government has any positive value is in that in that they are pro that there are at least certain aspects of the government are pro the Temple Mount. Now you you have to say so how how could this be that they're in the same government with the representatives of Hamas? How could it be that they support the Temple Mount? But remember. Who's missing from this government? Missing from this government are the what we call the Haredi parties, the ultra orthodox parties, who have been since the since the Six Day War have been against Jewish presence on the Temple Mount, uh, uh, claiming that there is a a prohibition on Jews entering the Temple Mount because of all kinds of ridiculous reasons. I mean, it's 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 so outrageous when you hear. Uh, so-called religious Jews, rabbis, scholars, saying it's pro prohibited for the Jews to go to the Temple Mount. I mean, oh, it's all right for Arabs to go there. It's all right for tourists to go there. But Jews? Why would Jews want to be on the Temple Mount? I mean, you know, it, it, it's unbelievable. I, I, I Sometimes I really I try to, to try to understand where they're coming from. It's so ridiculous. I mean, the Temple Mount is where the Temple stood. It's meant for the Jewish people. Jewish people are supposed to go there. It's supposed to not supposed to be Arabs there or tourists. It's not a tourist attraction. It's not a mosque. It's the Temple Mount. It's where the Temple stood. So Jews right. have to be there, and and to say that it's prohibited for us to be there, I mean, really, what, what I, I can't believe that intelligent people really think that way. This past Shabbat, like I said, we walked down to Hebron. Yeah. One of my friends, a rabbi from the from the from uh, Arba, walked down with us. And I said to him, I, I, I was talking to him on the way, and, and I said, you know, really, I don't, I don't understand. I said, now we have, like, we, we have this opportunity here to walk at least once a month in an area that they, they don't allow us to go to during the, you know, the, the, other, the, the rest of the month. And we take advantage of this opportunity, even though it involves um, – Army, army vehicles driving back and forth and blocking the Arabs and so on. But because we're, we're showing our, our sovereignty, this is important. Despite the fact that it's Shabbat or a, or a holiday or something. I, I said to him, so you know what? If, that's, if, if you can come here on Shabbat to show Jewish sovereignty, knowing that there are going to be army forces driving on Shabbat, then obviously you realize the importance of sovereignty. He says, yes. I said, okay, so doesn't that apply to the Temple Mount? Shouldn't that overcome any fears of us being uh, impure or whatever whatever the fears are? Shouldn't the sovereignty of the Temple Mount dictate that we all go up there and and, and, and take it over, that it, that it show it that it's ours? So, of course, you know, he, he smiles and has no answer. He smiles and has no answer. That is our problem. That that you have 
the rabbis and the leaders don't it should, don't uh, uh, go up and don't bring up their 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 students and their followers. I mean, ever since I came at Aliyah in 1976, the first Purim I was in Israel, we went up to the Temple Mount. 1976, it was really easy back then. You just walked in. There was no, there was practically nobody guarding the place. We walked in, four of us, and we started praying Mincha. Right away, the Arabs started fighting with us. We got into a fight with the Arabs, and then the police came and, of course, threw us out. But the bottom line is, is that in those days, it was so easy. I mean, today, to get into the Temple Mount, you have to go through all kinds of, you know, you know you've been up there, security yeah. checks and so on. Yeah. Um, but, but still, despite the fact that you have to go through all these, you know, you have to jump through hoops to get in there, it's so important, the the Jewish presence, that the whole movement centers today around bringing up more and more Jews. It used to be, I mean, there were other facets to the movement, educational facets and this and that, but I think we've all come to the conclusion that the main focus today is not wasting our time outside the Temple Mount, but the more we show presence in the Temple Mount, it's like a magnet attracting attracting more and more people. And it's really, I mean, it's really true. The more people see that there's, you know, they, they, they hear and they see that there are hundreds of people going every day. And this year is a record-setting year so far. Mm -hmm. More Jews have gone up so far this year, the first three months of, of, of 50, 58, what, what, no, 57, 82, have gone up this year more than any other year. So we're, we're, we're God, you know, uh, uh, with God's help, we're going to set a record this year for the, you know, first time in 2000 years, record set, record setting year of Jews going up to the Temple Mount. And like I said, the more they go up, the more people understand that it's, 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 it's a, a recognized, acceptable thing to do. And, and like I said, and the police also respect it. It, it, it. It's 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 a it's a give and take. When they Jews, they realize we have to give the Jews more, and so on. Plus Jews, the you know the the well, why, why should we why should we um, go out of our way to help them if they're not coming up? So, right. Really, that's so, the. In, uh, fact, in fact, Mark, so the Minister of uh, uh, Religious Affairs in Israel, Matan Kahana, he also said, I read this, he also said he's for Jewish prayer on Harbayat. So, where do you. So, we well, see that the classrooms are going to be going up. Uh, he's for prayer. Where do you see it? Do you see something being constructed eventually? on the Temple Mount um, as a first step, uh, as a uh, some, something constructed for Jews to pray, some kind of structure of a shul or something up there. Do you see that? I, look, I, I'll be honest with you. I <laughs> Jews can pray now on the Temple Mount without a structure. Okay. We're already okay. praying up there. Yep. Okay. Um, a structure that's a that's a, a synagogue, in my opinion, on Temple Mount will defeat the purpose. I mean, there are those that disagree with me and say, yes, okay. it would be a good thing to have a synagogue, uh, a, a Jewish a structure that serves the Jewish people on the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good idea because the Temple Mount it has to. We have to build the temple right. and all the facets of the temple. The facets of the temple, the the ritual of the temple, has nothing to do with our ritual in the synagogue. And and I'm afraid of this replacement kind of religion that is that we've come become accustomed to where we don't need a, a temple and sacrifices and the priestly service and so on and so forth because we can go to synagogue and pray right. and and we don't need all that. And that's right. what I'm that's what I'm fearful of. So I'm not one of those um people that, that that support the idea of building a structure for the purpose of praying. 
I, was I don't think that that's like, uh, that's you know, we don't need the Temple Mount for that. I was what? thinking more of like uh, uh, sort of like a huge tent that could obviously be dismantled and all that, where you could have uh, spar him there and like that. Um, Again, I, I you know it, it it could be it could be a step forward and it could be a step backwards. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure. The bottom line is that I've been you know the past the past uh, couple of years we've been able to pray more and more, right. uh, whether it's by heart or with our phones. I mean, if it's not Shabbat, you know Shabbat, they yeah. don't let us up. Right. And we have our phones and we pray with our phones. We have you know today. You're right. It's all there. Uh, the, it's all the, there. The, 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 yeah, it's all in there. That's the great thing about, you know, Amazing. they talk yeah. against the smartphone. The smartphone is the holiest thing today. It's, that's, that's it's got everything smart. in it. <laughs> yeah, that's unbelievable. I got the tea leaf in there. I say the Psalms when I go up there. I say the prayers when I go up there, and it's all in my phone. And they don't take your phone away. So. Right. No, even the, the even the orth, even super orthodox rabbis who go up there, they all have smartphones because, like the the Rosh Yeshiva of the Temple Mount Yeshiva, he gives a, a he gives a, a lesson a shiur the what's called the Daf Yomi, the 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 page in the in the Gemara that they learn every day. He gives it from his phone. It's incredible. You know? So, yeah. So yeah. I mean, no, you're right. It serves you're right. the phone. The phone so serves say, as, a, as a camera. Phone, bring your phone so you could daven properly, so you can learn properly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that's what it is. And so they could say to you at the entrance of the Temple Mount, no, no, <coughs> no religious books allowed. And Who I cares? <laughs> I got my phone. <laughs> so... The other That's day, beautiful. I was uh, the last time I went up to the Temple Mount. Uh, uh, I I was filming the the policeman telling us at the entrance of the Temple Mount, "You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do the other thing." And it's all things that we do, you know. And <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was just so funny. It's also interesting that the court ruled against. Um, in, in I think it was that case with Yuda Glick that was brought to the court, and the court uh, first ruled in in favor of prayer on the Temple Mount. Then a, high, a, a higher court, an appellate court, ruled against the prayer, saying right. the police can you know can stop the prayer. There's no we don't have any right to pray. The police can stop it, and then but the police don't even pay attention to what the court says anymore. Please do what they want. Right. <clears throat> it used to be that we, if we get a positive decision from the court, the police wouldn't enforce it. Now, even when we get a negative decision from the court, the police don't enforce it. Police do whatever they want. Right. right now, the police are in favor of letting us pray. And I believe there are reasons for that. But I think we have to take advantage of it. Right. And, and, and like I said, the more Jews there are, the more they're going to give us. It's as simple as that. It's a matter of numbers. If they see if they see a long line of Jews standing at the entrance to the Temple Mount waiting to get in, instead of tourists, then they're going to have to do something about the hours. They're going to have to do something about you know the days uh, that they let us in. They're going to have to make changes. Right. Um, today, now I've said for years, I, it should be our job to try to change the hours. I mean, we live here. We go to work here. We go to school here. We should have after school and after work hours on the Temple Mount, which we don't have yet. Right, right. But it's like some 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 of our leaders have said. Well, until we fill up the hours that it's open to us, they're not going to give us more hours. You know, yeah. after it's closed to us. So right. again, that's really uh, that's really the the what's going on today, and and. We see we see positive aspects to that. At least there's only the only place really where I see we're going forward instead of backwards is on the Temple Mount. Right. And I hope that we can keep up the progress. <clears throat> more and more people will go up. They'll get. We'll have more and more rights to pray there. And um, I tell you, I say today to people that come, if you're coming to the Temple Mount, 
don't come for one aliyah. In other words, you go up there and you do the you, you do the trip around for uh, half an hour or an hour, and then you come off. Go back up a second time. Go back up a third time. Don't you know? Because again, this is it's it's also an opportunity to show more that there every group that goes up there's more and more people take advantage of the fact that you're already there so you spend another half an hour an hour there so that's what i right. do that's what i do now i go, if i go there i don't go for one ali up there i go to, i go two or three um mm -hmm. that's why i like to go when there's a holiday because then i'm not working and i can i did on on uh shmini atzeret i did five aliot on that one day Went up, came off, went up, came off. I spent the whole day basically on the Temple Mount. Well, we're going so, to be uh, going into our next segment uh, about anti-Semitism soon, so we're wrapping up right now this one. So I'm just wondering, can you just leave, leave us with uh, words, uh, what, Rabbi, what the rabbi would say regarding Hanukkah and the state of affairs that we're in to leave our viewers with? Well, I mentioned before about the, the matter of the uh, Hellenism that Rabbi Ghana spoke about um, concerning Hanukkah. Also, in, in the, um, the Orion, the Jewish idea, the light of the Jewish idea, he also talks about the, um, the mitzvah, the commandment to go to war. Or is it, Jews think that war is a is a, is a, is like a is like a default program. Well, we have no choice; we have to fight. But that's not the case. War, as Rabbi Kahana taught us, and I think he was the the main spokesman for this mitzvah, this commandment of what we call a milchemet mitzvah, a war a a, a, a war of commandment, a, a a like any other mitzvah, like putting on tefillin, putting do, keeping Shabbat, keeping kashrut. All these mitzvot that we perform every day, um, there's a mitzvah to go to war, and that's important because it's not a default program. It's it's what we call the chatchila. It's the it's it's the way that Hashem wants us to address certain matters, and there's no other, no other way to address it other than to go to war. So He says that, um, and we know we know that the. Uh, the that uh, the Rambam brings it down, Maimonides that there were there are uh, several types of wars. There's a war we call a mechabit mitzvah, a war a, com a war that we're commanded to fulfill, like fighting Amalek, like uh, 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 liberating the land the lands of Israel against the seven nations, uh, a war of of self defense. There are wars that are, we're commanded to do, and he mentions here he says. That um, when we have a when we have a okay, he says that because of our, again the exile and our sins that we've again that are we don't have the understanding of the the halachot the uh, the 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 the, uh, the halachot of war and even the, the the wisest of men and rabbis don't understand and have no knowledge. Of what the of what the commandments are, and he says they don't understand the idea of a war that we're commanded to fulfill, um, and they ask the question: Is the war between us and the and the Muslims is that a war of a, a war we're commanded to do? And they don't. And and he says, how could anybody even possibly think that it's not a com a war of, uh, that we're commanded to to conduct? <clears throat> And he says there there are those that think that we can't go to war against our enemies if we don't have a, a high priest and a Sanhedrin and a king. He says it's ridiculous. The Rambam he brings down the Rambam as I mentioned before in the commandments of the kings Hilchot Melachim. He says in a Melchemet Mitzvah, a war that we're commanded to fulfill, we do not need to take take permission. Um, from the Beit Din, from the Sanhedrin, from the from the court, but we go out and, and fight the war and force the the nation to go to fight this war. <coughs> so we see here that 
that uh, when the time of the Maccabees, what happened then? The Maccabees didn't have a king. They were, they were priests. And they didn't ask the Sanhedrin, the high court, if they should go to war or not go to war, fight the, 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 the Greeks, the Hellenists. If they would have asked the question, they probably would have been turned down. But they didn't. They said, this is a Muhammad mitzvah. This is a, a war of commandment. We have to go fight the enemies. The enemies of Israel are preventing us from serving in the temple. They are preventing us from keeping the, the, the ritual that we, you know, that we that we're commanded to keep. And therefore, we have no right to, to sit back and let it happen. And they rose up, a handful of Jews, and started the war. Started the war on a very, very uh, uh, local basis in the in the city of Modin at the time, where the where the where the the, the Hashmonai family lived back in in those days, and it started there on a very, you know, very limited local basis, and then spread like wildfire till it took till it it, 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 it grabbed the entire nation. But that's the that's the that's the idea that even a handful of Jews who understand that there are times when they are obligated to go to war, even though they're not the uh, the government, they're not the Sanhedrin, they're not the, the 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 high court, they're not the king, but they understand that at those times they're they are obligated to fight. It's a war of it's a war of commandment, even if it's individuals. It's a war of commandment. So, in many ways, our presence on the Temple Mount, as I've mentioned before, it's part of this war of commandment. A lot of I, as I as I explained earlier, I, as I explained to this rabbi on Shabbat, I said we have an obligation to conquer the Temple Mount. It's it's still. In many ways, not in our hands. Even though we've liberated the sixties in the Six Day War, even though the Israeli police are present there, but the Arabs, you know, they conduct the they they conduct uh, the you know their their business. They're in charge of what goes on there every day. They administer the Temple Mount, and the only way that we can stop that is for us to conquer the Temple Mount. And conquering the Temple Mount means basically, in in, in this essence, is not even picking up arms and going to fight. It's just taking your two feet and go and walking up there. That's 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 the idea here of conquering the Temple Mount. And so that's my message for Hanukkah is if we really want to um, redeem the, 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 the land of Israel, the people of Israel, the entire world, and bring the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate uh, redemption, it requires that the temple not be in our hands. Mm -hmm. the, the temple is the main facet of this redemption. And without understanding that, without, without dealing with that, and without conquering the temple mount, like I said, with our two feet, our, our, our uh, national two feet, is mm -hmm. uh, it, we're not going to bring about this redemption. We're just going to have more and more suffering as Rabbi Kahana constantly told us, there are two ways of redemption. The easy way and the hard way. Mm -hmm. And the hard way is the way, unfortunately, we're going. Because the easy way would mean us for us to do what we have to do, redeem the Temple Mount, re rebuild the Temple, renew the sacrifices, renew the Sanhedrin, renew all these things that were the basic facets of the Jewish state, and ultimately achieve a king, which we believe, which we hope is the so with that message, I wish you all a happy Hanukkah and come to Eretz Israel very soon. And uh, there's plenty of room here. Plenty Absolutely. of room. Hope to see you late December there. I mean, Borough, thanks very much. Hug some ass. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with our second segment where we're addressing issues of uh, anti-semitism affect us um i mentioned earlier that uh we were able to uh, effectively lobby members of qp national to vote against the bds motion so we had a success there but um 
Obviously, uh, a few hours later, uh, we find out about more anti-Semitism taking root on campuses and in in other venues as well. There's a lot of work to do. We've got to roll up our sleeves and get busy. Uh, we have with us, uh, I think he's with us now, Ron East, that could join us. And we're going to be discussing um, these issues. Is uh, Ron with us? Oh, let's bring Ron on in a second. This is for everybody who's not familiar with Ron. Ron is the founder and editor of the JCA, which is the Jewish voice of Zionism and reason for Jewish news locally and internationally coming out of Canada. And just want to make a quick comment, just again, thanking, of course, Burke for being with us. And when he was with us, he has his insight and his wisdom. And let's see if we have a couple of quick pictures. I did want to also mention when he is talking about the Temple Mount. Yes. When I was up on the Temple Mount in the 80s, it wasn't, don't feel like you're a visitor. I felt like I was going home. And I think that's important mm -hmm. when you go there. And just, just for the, our, with our hope for the future, I thought I'd just uh, demonstrate a little bit. So there's uh, probably a transition between the Temple Mount. You know, we can yes. kind of have uh, Netanyahu there with a uh, Trump, you know, visiting the Trump Tower. And remember BDS is buy Israeli projects, products, donate to Israeli charities, support the state of Israel. And once again, thanking Baruch for the time he spent with us. We'll bring Ron on in a second. But I thought since it is Hanukkah, we need to at least play a little bit of Hanukkah music right in the middle and also at the end of our show. Of course. So let's bring on, this is from the Park Avenue Synagogue in New York where Rabbi Avi Schwartz is an amazing, we'll just do little segments as mayor as you need a break. But just for now, I thought we'd... Uh, We'll do a little more of that a little later. We'll take a break from Mari. Ron, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent, doing excellent. I was uh, listening in the background to uh, the last hour with uh, Baruch. Um, you know, a very insightful, a very wise person. Um, you know, some of the stuff that he said definitely uh, resonates. Uh, I like the uh, more of commandment uh, that he was speaking of at the end. I believe that what Mayor does every day, what we do every day, um, is indeed that. It's a war of commandment. You know, we don't do it because somebody asked us to do it. We don't do it because we ask permission of somebody to do it. We do it because it's the absolutely right thing to do, and it's the only thing to do. So, no, that's what we're doing from now, and it's called the War of Commandment. I, I love that term. So, hi, Mayor. How are you doing? Thank God. I'm doing well. Hug some air. Hug some air to you, too. Listen, yes. my house smells delicious. The smell of latkes combined with my wife is just making this of ganiot as we're speaking here. And uh, my house is just, uh, you know, amazing with the, uh, you know, feeling and love of Hanukkah. We decorated the whole house. We've got lights that are going to go on outside tonight. And, Beautiful. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful holiday. It's the most Zionistic holiday that I can think of. Um, and it's the one holiday, you know, that uh, gives no doubt to our connection to the state of Israel, to the Temple Mount, and to sovereignty and freedom and our indigenuity to Judea. So it's a wonderful holiday. It really is 100%. There's no question about it. Uh, and what's going on, we see uh, <laughs> we see these uh, so-called Jewish BDS groups that uh, um, they say they, they try to spin what the meeting is, meaning of Hanukkah is uh, as they support Hamas and the destruction of Israel. Uh, the very essence of uh, the holiday of Hanukkah is uh, restoring Israel. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is, and they can try and spin it any way they want. I was just engaging with uh, 
the Jewish Voices for Peace who put up, you know, that they were going to do eight days of anti-Zionist Hanukkah. And I just mentioned to them that, you know, doing an anti-Zionist Hanukkah is the same as celebrating an anti-Christian Christmas. You know, the two things don't jive and you can, you know, mix and mask it whichever way you want. But Hanukkah stands simply for the, you know, for the rededication of the temple and for claiming sovereignty again over our homeland and our indigenous homeland, Judea and Samaria and Israel as a whole. You know, it's a wonderful holiday. And it's the one holiday that sticks it right in the face of all the haters. And it's the holiday that uh, we want to celebrate. And and we go out and we buy, we try to find the best. Well, you're limited in Winnipeg, but in Toronto and obviously in New York <laughs> and all over the place and a lot of other places, <clears throat> there are a surplus of kosher bakeries. That, uh, they're, they're almost like in a competition uh, who can make the best Savganiot or Latkes? And in Israel, it's all over the place. But here in Toronto, we have an issue at uh, the University of Toronto, the yes. Scarborough uh, location, that the student union just passed a motion. And the woman who heads the student union, she's, uh, I mean, looking at her picture, she looks like she's from the Islamic faith. So I can't Let me throw her on real quick while you got a minute. So yes. just anybody who is just joining us, I thought mm -hmm. perhaps we just go and um, show that. So if you missed the first half, it's available on YouTube. It's available on yeah, Facebook. Yeah. You can watch it after the fact. You're just joining us now. So we finished the first half where we did have Baruch Ben Yosef from Israel. The second half is going to be about anti-Semitism on campus, which unfortunately is a chronic issue, just never goes away. But the president of the University of Toronto Scarsborough campus is Sarah Abdullahi. And she said, besides the fact that she's quoted as saying, University of Toronto really ain't shit, which is not what you'd want from the student. And she also says proudly, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And she's basically spearheading this whole move not only to endorse BDS, but to ban kosher food on the campus. What she's also has said is that the president of the college, um, President Gertner, is complicit with racism. By the way, President Gertner is the son of Holocaust survivor. His mother survived. She's Czechoslovakian. So the nerve she has even making these comments. So guys, before I get too excited, I'm going to get myself <laughs> out of the picture, bring you guys back in. When you need a break, let me know, and I'll play some more music. Talk to you guys later. So Ron, you know, it looks she looks like she's of the Islamic faith. I don't know it a hundred percent. I mean, she just looks by the pictures. And I'm just wondering, uh, I see seems like a pattern that uh, leaders of a lot of different BDS groups are of the Islamic faith, and uh, certainly Al Quds Day is an Islamic rally. Uh, it almost seems that it's uh, endemic in the uh, Islamic society or culture to bash Israel, this anti-Semitism. Um, I'd like to hear from Islamic organizations to denounce her position because she put it into their uh, constitution, what they voted on, to prohibit Jews on campus, Jewish students on campus, from uh, bringing kosher food to campus if they're from kosher suppliers that support Israel in any way. Now, being Hanukkah, you can imagine the Jewish students on campus at, <clears throat> at University of Toronto, they may want to bring uh, a Chabad rabbi, let's say, on campus, who will bring uh, kosher Hanukkah food on campus and Chabad, they support Israel. So according to see, the, what she but, wants but the, is to prohibit that. But the problem begins even before that, because not mm -hmm. only does she want to prohibit the kosher food, she wants to prohibit the Jewish organizations themselves that are supportive of Israel. Mm -hmm. So by prohibiting the organization themselves, by shutting down their ability to act, you know, as Jewish organizations within the university setting, yeah, you right. don't have to go to the next step of inviting mm -hmm. the rabbi and having the kosher food come in. There's nobody that can invite him because you can't have those Jewish groups operating. 
Right. It won't happen because the only Jewish groups that can operate will be the independent Jewish voices, the If Not Now, the Jewish Voices mm -hmm. for Peace, uh, you know, the BDS supporting organizations who, you know, would go to some halal uh, restaurant yeah. and get the sufganiyot made there. Um, you know, and then shut out everybody else who's pro-Israel, whether you're Hillel, whether you're Hasbara Fellowship, whether you're, um, you know, students in support of Israel, whatever the organization might be, those organizations will be no longer welcome. So I'm not aware of, of any uh, Islamic organization condemning this behavior from this uh, leader of the student union on campus. And I know that uh, Sija and... Um, there's a number of different uh, Jewish leaders, rabbis that meet with uh, Islamic leaders and organizations. I'm not hearing anything from these Islamic leaders. They won't, Islamic organizations they won't condemn. They won't condemn. They can't condemn. They don't have the capability or the ability to condemn because of the structure of their own societies and their own communities, the culture, the history, the background. They won't condemn. What they'll try to do is they'll try to find a way to make it sound or spin it in a way that it sounds different than what we as Jews interpreted as being. For example, them already saying, no, we're not trying to deny kosher food you know, on campus. What we're suggesting is we want to deny those suppliers who support the apartheid Jewish state from having an opportunity to gain a profit you know, from being on campus. So it's not that we don't want kosher food. You know, it's like saying that like, like when they came out with the statement saying they're going to treat the Jewish students as separate but equal. Now, last time I was anywhere, people were treated by separate but equal was when I lived in, in South Africa and, you know, there was apartheid. And they mm -hmm. claimed to try that they were going to treat the blacks, you know, as, as separate but equal. So when you say you're going to separate, you know, you're going to treat people as separate but equal, you're segregating people. And you're putting, you know, for all intents and purposes, an, an unseen, you know, a yellow star on them, you know, on the Jewish students of that university at that moment. And you're ostracizing them. But you're still saying, you know, no, we're going to treat you as equal but separate. That doesn't work. It will not work. Um, you know, I'm certainly hopeful that the university will wake up and realize that their over-liberalism, their over-openness to wokeism, their pretending, you know, that they're open to free speech and to everything else has opened up such a Pandora's box for them that if they're not careful, the Palestinian cause is over going to take their own university campuses everywhere. It's not going to be about learning anymore. And it's not going to be about educating the, the future generations. It's going to be about maligning Israel, maligning Jews, and making it a place where it's uncomfortable to be a student, a professor, a librarian, or anybody else of the Jewish faith. And that's incredible to me. You know? And with all due respect to everybody who is um, applauding the letter from the president of the university, I can tell you, Mary, for the last 20-plus years that I've been doing what I've been doing, I've been hearing the plethora of these, you know, condemnations and concerns and outrages that have been put on paper, but there's been no follow-up to really show any intention beyond the words on paper. You and I spoke, I believe, you know, just before Shabbat came in, and I said to you, you know, how is that uh, national uh, summit to fight anti-Semitism working for you? Mm -hmm. You know, that happened, what, two, three, four months ago, just before the election? Yes, yes. How, how is it working for you? What, what, what have they done? So, again, a plethora of words, a lot of pictures, a lot of kosher food being eaten, you know, a lot of handshakes, a lot of goodwill, but no real structure and real effective doing of anything. And then you see what's happening on Scarborough. You see what's happening in the Toronto District School Board. And you know what? We're talking about Toronto because Toronto is where the main Jewish community in Canada lives. But don't, you know, be fooled. It's happening everywhere. It's happening in Winnipeg, it's happening in Vancouver, it's mm -hmm. happening in Hamilton, in Mississauga, in Saskatoon, in Regina. You know, I have a friend in Regina, I'll tell you a quick story. A friend, an Israeli mm -hmm. friend who lives in Regina. Right. And right. for my job, I used to travel to Regina quite often. Mm -hmm. You know, and we would meet in Regina over, you know, beer or dinner or whatever. And he would always laugh at me about what was going on in Winnipeg with anti-Semitism, the rise. You know, I'm in Regina, we're immune, nothing happens here, you know, there's no anti-Semitism here. Guess what happened last year to his daughter? Hmm, That's me. what I'm doing at school. The anti-Semitism that she faced was standing up for Israel during the war. You know, he called me, you know, concerned what to do. You know, at school, they were following her to the car. They were yelling at her. They were calling her names. They were threatening her, you know, because she was standing for Israel, right? So all of a sudden, you know, even in a small town, Regina, right. you know, it's no longer safe to be a pro-Israel Jew. And, you know, our community you know, has to recognize that this is something that's now infected the country from coast to coast to coast. 
and universes are just the easiest place for this to take place. You know, and look at the, um, what was it last week? The uh, Union of Teachers, if I believe they represent 70,000 university. Yes, yes. Yeah, university teachers, not professors, but I'm assuming it's uh, the people a little bit below mm -hmm. professors. They have 70,000 members. They passed a resolution not to accept the definition of IRA. Right. Who are they? Who are they? With all due respect right. to whoever they are, who are they to tell me? Whether they're going to accept and not accept the definition of what I'm telling them is anti-Semitism because I'm the Jew who feels it, not them. Mm -hmm. they Can you imagine a white person telling a black person what right. racism is or isn't? Can you imagine you that? Know, it only happens with Jews. You know, it, it, it's incredible. Imagine yeah. a man telling a woman, you know, what a woman's rights should or shouldn't be. Women went to the streets. We fought over these things. Yeah. You know, it's outrageous yeah. that in today's world, still Jews cannot you know, self-identify for themselves what anti-Semitism is and who the people who get to identify it for us are the same people who cause the anti-Semitism, like this lady at the Scarborough, you know, university. Yeah, what needs to happen there is that uh, the leadership of the student union that passed that motion uh, needs to be replaced. Uh, number two, the university must adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. And number three, uh, Obviously, the student union must be bound by the IRA definition of, of anti-Semitism. And they need to choke That's their it. funding. There should be no funding going to this kind of an organization. An organization yes. who is utterly this anti-Semitic right. needs to right. immediately have all resources available to it from the university shut down. From funding to office space to equipment to whatever the case might be. You cannot operate in 2021 as an openly racist anti-Semitic organization and have a public university fund your anti-Semitism. It's incredible. It's a, it wouldn't happen to indigenous people. It wouldn't happen to the black community. Right. How dare they do this to the Jewish community? Right. So I sent a letter to the president of uh, University of Toronto articulating that. I haven't heard back yet, but uh, nonetheless, we're going to have to mount a campaign just like we did with QP and the uh, museum. Uh, we also mounted that campaign. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to mount a campaign about University of Toronto. That uh, concrete action has to happen, and these people have to be replaced. And oh, absolutely, there's no question about it. And we're going to have to have serious introspection in our Jewish community when our leaders are meeting with. Islamic leaders who sanction that kind of anti-Semitism. It's uh, it's intolerable, and there can't be any spin. This is exactly what it is. And by the way, the major Jewish organizations have recognized that this is anti-Semitism. So if they are meeting with uh, uh, Islamic organizations that are justifying it, well, they got to cut it off right now until you know this is these groups. This is right. This is no different than you know than what you're seeing happening with Iran and the and the um, United States and 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 the you know global community you know as Iran mm -hmm. continues to progress to build the, the the nuclear bomb and everybody can see it like you know it's not even like they're doing magic right. tricks or everybody can see that's what's happening but right. and so instead of, of of just saying we had enough you know we're going to put a foot down this is it the world is still in this you know let's meet let's engage let's talk so i right. feel our jewish community leadership is in the same way they see what's happening outside the shul is burning but you know what before we call the police before we call the firefighters let's just sit and have a little bit more of a dialogue you know and all the dialogue does it doesn't buy us any time it buys our enemies more time to become more entrenched to become let more, more, more let me add to that let me, let me add to that ron so uh there's a synagogue here in toronto called the dark Noam, and they're having an event uh later this later this week going forward uh on the issue of anti-semitism they have invited one of the leaders of the bds uh, uh independent jewish voices uh to make a presentation about on this topic uh yeah. anti-semitism now i've done some research Apparently, uh, uh, some of these BDS people go to that synagogue and they're, the red carpet is rolled out for them, so on and so forth. On the panel is uh, a representative of CJA as well. Now, I've sent messages out to CJA. I've called for them to withdraw because they're going to uh, legitimize uh, the independent Jewish yeah. voices. 
As of this past weekend, yesterday, there was a protest in front of the Israeli consulate in Toronto. The Independent Jewish Voices was a sponsor of it. Another group, there was a number of BDS groups, but another group that was a sponsor of it was also Samadon. Now, Samadon, yeah. the government of Israel, has placed on the terror list of organizations. But and rightly so. Aside from that, right, right. Aside from that, Samadon uh, made a statement on their Twitter account uh, this past week, where they supported and justified the recent terrorist attack in Jerusalem with a right. Hamas uh, member who murdered a Jew in Jerusalem. Correct. So they are partnering and sponsoring, co-sponsoring events with this organization, Samadon, that puts it in black and white where they stand, uh, and they support that. And then we have a synagogue inviting person uh, in a leadership capacity from independent Jewish voices, and Sija is going to go. That's how messed up the leadership is in the Jewish community. Now, I have asked uh, leaders of Sija to come on the program here. And we have had prominent lawyers on the show and very good professors on the show as well. No one from Sija is ready to come on the show, but they're ready to sit down on a panel with a person, a leader of the BDS in, uh, Independent Jewish Voices. That's but, but, Mayor, but Mayor, you and I... You and I have had a discussion about this. You know my position on this. You know where I come up to, out on this. You know that you know they see you and me and those of us who are in the pro-Israel um, grassroots movement as a threat to them. Right. You know they don't like us. You know so they'll rather sit with independent Jewish voices and have a conversation with them and see if they somehow can come to some kind of a mutual understanding on what what I have no idea. An organization just yesterday, you know, cried because QP didn't pass a BDS movement. You know, right. is someone going to come out and tell me about what anti-Semitism is or is an organization that's fighting, you know, against the IRA definition every step of the way, leading the fight in Canada against the IRA definition and celebrating every time that a union, organization, university defeats it. You know, what, what exactly is the purpose of you sitting with them in a synagogue together? But they would not dare have a same conversation with you because you're a bigger threat to the organized community you know, and I'm putting in parentheses, then independent Jewish voices will ever be. So that's why you're not invited. That's why you're not entertained. That's mm -hmm. why Sija won't come on your show. And I call on Sija. I call on all of them. Come on our show. Answer the question. Tell the community what you're doing to defend the community. Not about the letters you're writing. Not about, you know, the meetings behind the scenes you're having over coffee and Zoom. You know, tell us concretely, what are you doing? What have you done on the street? What actions can we physically see as a community? What can I do as a community member to feel secure and safe in by what you're doing for me? And the answer is nothing. You can't measure anything of what they're doing. It's right. a bunch of plethora and writing letters and putting stuff up on Twitter. But when it comes to action, when it comes to doing something important, it never gets done. And to me, an important thing is, you know, something like Scarborough, where is Sija to show up there with a food truck, kosher food truck, and serve free? kosher food to everybody in that at that campus with Israeli right. flags, right. with Israeli music, and show them, you know, what defiance is and what, you know, Jews saying never again really means. It doesn't mean picking up the phone and calling the university, you know, um, and, and president, you know, and that being your only option. You know, that's one option. But you're the leadership for community. We need somebody to follow. You know, you need somebody that you want to feel that you can go to war with. And I have to tell you, Mayor, until today, you know, outside of yourself, you know, and some other few people out there, when it comes to our organized community, there's nobody to follow. There's nobody that I'd be willing to take my weapon out for and follow mm -hmm. into the war. None right. of them. Because they don't right. even know what leadership truly means. But that's mm -hmm. the problem. That's why they'll sit in a synagogue. Then I'm reading some of the replies are over, here, over here from the readers. In a synagogue, apparently, you already, already have been overtaken by the woke and the BDS, you know, side of, of our community. And, and, you know, they're going to come there and legitimize that, that and then come out and try to say that some of them were victorious. They had a, a blah, blah, blah. And they talked and, you know, it's not going to do anything. Independent Jewish Voices is going to take it and they're going to slice and dice it. And they're going to put it up on their websites and they're going to declare victory. And then all the other Jew-hating organizations are going to take it and they're going to retweet it. And there'll be no victory for anybody. Only another sad defeat for Sija and our leadership. It's, it's, it's a poor choice to do that, a very poor choice. Absolutely. Uh, I think our doctor in the studio has a, uh, a video that he wants to show, I think, with a Hanukkah theme. 
I see something there being uh, in the bottom of the uh, screen. I see that he has something. Oh, he does? Oh. Uh, well, I have lots oh. of things when you want to break. My, I'm going to be the voice of uh, celebration. So if you want there to you go, celebrate break, us. I'll play a little more music. Shall we well, do that? Well, let's see something. Yeah, from Hanukkah. Give a, a little, list. A little, because... little Hanukkah. Okay. A lift. Yes, absolutely. Oi, V. Oh, Dread, oh, Dread. got a voice that's for sure oh he's he terrific sing. yeah he can absolutely sing you know as, as we listen to all this it's uh you know we were getting the house ready today for hanukkah with the kids and you know, the kids are asking the questions about the holiday and the yeah. meaning significance and we're talking about it and my kids you know always question and say you know if they're all this you know why why is there all this you know questioning of our you know right mm -hmm. to to israel why is there all this you know questioning of our indigenuity our connection why are people so refusing to accept you know the story as it's told you know and, and it was amazing as i'm listening to the story and the mizbech and everything else and it's uh, fascinating to me to think you know that um, even today in 2021 there's still people who just refuse to acknowledge you know it, it, it takes an acknowledgement to take the next step towards resolution you know and it's amazing that in 2021 we still have to fight for that acknowledgement yep. of our right in our existence in our homeland you know, and until that 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 acknowledgement will be there from the wider community, you know, we can't move a step forward. But what's even more interesting, as I told my kids, is that as the Palestinians continue to whine and 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 retell their story, you know, their false story again and again and again, it's like a kid at school or a kid at home, you know, keeps on whining to their parents, you know. And if you keep on complaining too long about something that doesn't seem to be real, after a while, people shut you out and they move on. And I said to my kids, if you take a look, that's what happened to the Arab world. For 70 years, they've been whining in the Arab world's ears. And at some point, the Arab world just woke up and said, we've had enough. We can't handle this anymore. And the Arab world moved on towards the Israel and towards the Jewish people. Now the only people that they can whine to are the woke people within the Western world. And now it's just a question of how long it'll take the Western world to wake up and recognize that this whining that's going on in the background, this, this um, false tailing of a story, you know, at some point, you know, is, is, is also, you know, going to be too much for for the West. And it's just a question of when that will happen. But we're starting to see it. QP, you know, 68% people rejecting mm -hmm. a BDS motion. Yep. You know, that's a, that's a huge number. That's 7 yep. out of 10 people who said no. Yep. You know, that gives us uh, some sense of, uh, of hope that sensibility is taking over. You know, when I look at the United States and I look at uh, what's happening there in, 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 in the sense of elections, in politics, you know, I, I, again, university is a separate issue. But when I look at how the Americans have woken up now and recognized that perhaps, you know, they were a bit overzealous in uh, in trying to get Trump out of office, and perhaps they weren't uh, quite as understanding of how green the grass truly was, you know, on their side of the fence. Uh, you see now, you know, whether it's elections for uh, for House, like local senates, or whether it's uh, elections for. Uh, mm -hmm. For um, state, um, you know, representation, it's going more into the side of Republicans. People are understanding the threat that is innate within the right. Democratic Party that's been taken over, you know, by the woke uh, side. And I just want to bring it back to Canada. Um, you know, I have a concern with our own government here. 
and how much um, influence um, the NDP has um, over our government and the decisions the government make, specifically because the NDP, unlike UP, didn't have the gumption or the maturity to um, put away BDS and actually accepted it as part of their of their platform. And they're now a you know the one party that really is in power in a sense in our government because they can either prop the government up or they can make the government fall. So the liberals, you know, are much more in, in need of support from the NDP. And I think as a Jewish community, we need to be very aware of that and, and act very quickly when we see any kind of signs where the NDP is having a negative influence on some of the inroads that we've been making, specifically when it comes to uh, anti-Semitism, the IRA definition, and some of those other things. Because I think pressure will have to be put on government at some point right. um, to ensure that what's happening in universities is put to an end. I don't think that strictly going directly at the university road is going to be the end all and be all of it. I certainly think there needs to be a push within our community to go to our major donors. Those who have been donating for years and years to these, to these um, universities and having a real heart-to-heart -heart talk about whether now is not the right time to pull that uh, donation. Right. Right. Um, you know, money talks um, in right. these kind of institutions, which depend largely on donations to survive. Um, and make sure that if we're going to spend money from within our community on, or going to, on universities, it should be those universities that are very pro-Jewish and pro-Israel. And I mm -hmm. put this challenge out here now to any organization, either whether it be Bnei B'rit, Hasbara, um, Simon Wiesenthal, who's going to come up with a list of the top 10 universities that are most pro-Israel, pro pro-Jewish in Canada, but we should be sending our students to. You know, my kid is 15. He's going to be 18 before I know it. We're going to have to make a decision what university we want to send him to. And trust me, this is a big decision, you know, that's going to play a big role in our decision is, you know, where is he going to feel safe as a pro-Israel Jew, as a Zionist, you know? Absolutely. In which university is he going to be feeling welcome? And which mm -hmm. university is going to feel ostracized? And yep. I think our community has to recognize that our future children, you know, are slowly, you know, are going to have to face this dilemma. And us as adults, we need to make do something to put a stop to it. No, 100%, 100%. Okay, so uh, we're going to wind down and we're going to start to uh, have another show coming up, uh, maybe midweek or by the end of the week, uh, that we're not going to let go of this issue with the uh, University of Toronto and the student union there. <clears throat> to any of our viewers out there, if you have any information about personalities that run this uh, uh, student union, we want the information, please send it to us. Uh, share it with us. Uh, we're going to go after them and we're going to call for action. We're, uh, we're not asleep at the switch. We're not like our uh, uh, Jewish organizations out there, typical organizations out there that um, uh, they're just going to send some kind of a meaningless letter to the president of uh, University of Toronto saying, oh, we'd like a little bit more. Give me a break. Uh, no, no. We have to specify concretely what we want. And we have to go for it and that's it and it is a criminal offense in canada what they are advocating and that's it and we have the law on our hands and morality on our hands and we have to go for it and we can't take a back seat and the meaning of hanukkah is that we stood up it, it actually started when uh uh the greeks impo the greeks were ridiculing judaism and making it almost impossible to keep. That's why we spin dreidels on uh, Hanukkah, because the, the kids were studying Torah, uh, which was a criminal offense by the Greeks at the time. And when they saw that officials were coming close to them, they'd put the dreidels, uh, they'd put the uh, uh, the Talmuds and the uh, Sparum aside, and they'd take out their tops, and they start playing with their tops, making it seem that that's what they've been doing all day. Um, but there's more to the story also. And the story started with, because they degraded also the Jewish women, that they made it uh, that any Jewish woman who was to be married, uh, the night before her wedding ceremony, she would have to sleep with the governor or other high ranking officials in the Greek uh, uh, government then. And, so this was rape. And uh, one Jewish woman, she had her wedding party with uh, her family there and guests there. And, uh, and it was from the priestly family that started the revolt. 
And um, so she's dressed up. And then she took her clothes off. And everybody was in shock. And she said, <clears throat> she said, you're in shock at what you see right now, but you know that from here, I'm going to be taken by the governor and he's gonna be spending the night with me. And you're not in shock about that. Just like Shimon and Levy, when they heard about Dina, their sister, they took action against Shem and rescued her when she was raped. That's what you should be doing now. And then they thought about it. And that's when they started to plot how to overthrow the Greeks. It was from that moment and that we have to take a stand because what's going on, kosher food, this is humiliation of the Jewish people. Absolutely. And all these acts of anti-Semitism are. And therefore, we have to say no, never again, and stand up. That's Hanukkah. That's it. That's all it is. It's a mayor. I don't think we can finish it with any better words than that. You hit it on the nail. These are the, you know, the modern day Greeks, and we are the modern day Maccabees. And yes. they're trying to deny us our right to be Jewish. They're humiliating us. They're trying to define to us what is and isn't being Jewish, what we can and cannot do, what food we can and cannot have, where we can and cannot eat, what we can and cannot gather for. Not going to happen. Not in right. 2021. Okay, I think our doctor has something to <laughs> leave us with. I have a song to end all songs for Hanukkah with. <laughs> and uh, happy Hanukkah to everybody before that. Amen. And any any final parting words for Hanukkah before our final song, and then I'll go to the end credits. Okay. No, I think I think Mayor hit it on the on, on the nail that that was very powerful, Mayor. Okay, here we go. Love it. And we do, by the way, have permission to use this, so there'll be no copyright infringement. I have it in writing, and it's very nice of them to give it in writing. The band leader who actually organized this. So I'll keep it on at the end, so you can see all of the credits. And here we go.
and latkes to eat And while we are playing The candles are burning low One for each night they shed a sweet light To remind us of days long ago One for each night they shed a sweet light To remind us of days long ago Celebrate. <laughs> I am well, guys, ready. want to give your closing comments? We'll do the credits. Go ahead, uh, I am, Okay. Listen, what a wonderful show. Amazing show. And my favorite holiday of holidays to celebrate. And I'm looking forward to spending time with family and friends. want to wish everybody all the best on Hanukkah. May the light of Hanukkah shine bright in everybody's houses. And let's recommit ourselves today to continue the fight that we started for our people, for Israel, for Zionism. This is a war of commandment, and we're going to continue it every single day. That's my commitment today. Absolutely. We're going to keep speaking the truth and uh, shining a candle uh, in a world of darkness. And Absolutely. on the one hand, we're commanded to do this. On the other hand, we have no choice. We just have to do it. And we better do it. We should do it for the positive reason, because why not reap the benefit uh, and everything positive that comes with that, that that's the essence of Judaism. So we stand up as proud Jews celebrating Hanukkah and going forward and never, never, never uh, giving up. Because Amen. as what's going on in Jerusalem, what we were discussing earlier about uh, more and more awareness about uh, the Temple Mount, going up and now we're going to have classrooms visiting uh we're at a historic point in history for the jewish people and we want to be part of it that meme of uh, jared kushner and ivanka trump uh it's fabulous he's responsible for the uh abraham accords a blessing to the jewish people we're a going for the world great stuff is happening a blessing to the world too yes tremendous era that we're living in reasons we have no idea why god said we're going to be living in this era but it's historic what's going on and like i said before also over seven million jews living in israel right now it's incredible it's uh it's just such a blessing israel it is thriving it is moving in a positive direction jewish identity is strong the president of israel going to hebron to light the menorah there uh, uh amongst all the uh in defiance of all the uh threats from hamas and the bds and that we're doing the right thing the jewish people is on the right positive trajectory and uh we're going to keep it going thank you very much for joining us until next time Hug some half, everybody Hug some half.